This episode of NGB Ideas was recorded in August 2023. From Lab Occupier, this is NGB Ideas, a podcast about the personal journey of leaders, innovators, and disruptors in the Canadian life sciences community. I'm Jim Wilson, and on the show today is the story of Gordon McCauley from Admari Bioinnovations. All parts are important, but the one piece we're missing today is that series of domestic anchor companies. It's also important to note that if you ask this question six, seven years ago, we didn't really have much prospect of of an anchor company. But when you look around today and you see Abcellera and Stem Cell and Xenon and Bellis was just sold, they see uh, Abdera, there's a long list of 10 or 15 potential anchor companies. So we're making significant progress towards that and we're meaningfully better today than we were even five years ago. And we just need to get to a point where there are multiple domestic anchor companies in Canada. That will make a profound change in the sustainability of this life sciences ecosystem. We talked today with Gordon McCauley about how he navigated from politics to investment banking to becoming one of the key leaders in the Canadian life sciences community. So, For decades, scaling startups in Canada's life sciences sector have struggled for funding, facilities, and support. Most cities across Canada with universities that have strong faculties in medicine, business, science and engineering, and direct relationships with a research hospital have had nascent life sciences hubs. The goal of Admari Bioinnovations is to be a national catalyst for growing these hubs and the community at large. And our guest today is the president and CEO of that organization. Canadian Life Sciences is experiencing a generational moment that is attracting attention. And our guest today is arguably at center stage. Gordon McCauley, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And and I have to start off with a question completely off script. You go by Gord or Gordon? Whichever makes you happy. I understand you were born in Vancouver, and before we go there, I would like to say that often people say, well, I'm from you know this big city or that big city, when in fact they're not. They're just from somewhere close by. Are you from Vancouver proper or somewhere close by? I was born in Vancouver. We moved to Toronto when I was six months old. I grew up in Toronto and moved to Vancouver. I spent the majority of my life in Toronto and came here for all bunch of reasons. My dad was a Torontonian who was hosted to Vancouver for a few years. My mother was a Vancouverite, and and uh, she used to joke that she never forgave him for taking her away from her mountains. But I grew up in Toronto. You were the youngest of four brothers and two sisters. What's the age spread between the youngest and oldest? The age spread uh, between me and my oldest sister is 18 years. Wow. So was she still in the house when you were born? No. In fact, when I was born and we left Vancouver, she was in nursing college and uh, stayed in nursing college in Vancouver. So she didn't ever actually come to Toronto. I'm the youngest of five siblings and my brothers and sisters often accuse me of being an afterthought. Do you go through that as well? Jeez. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Let's put it this way, Jim. My brothers are five, four, and three years older than me. Okay. You're pretty safe. But being the youngest is a pretty good position. I have this theory that being youngest makes you tougher. I'm pretty sure that nobody else in the birth order feels that way, but I think it does. I understand that two of your brothers are no longer with us. I'm I'm sorry for that. I lost a sister 13 years ago, and I I think of her every day, and I I miss her smile and and her advice. Is the rest of your immediate family in the GTA? Are they all across the country? Kind of all over the place. One sister in rural Ontario, one sister in Victoria, and a brother in Toronto. My parents are sadly long gone. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Who would your siblings say you're most alike, your mother or your dad? I actually think that they would argue I'm a very peculiar amalgam of all of them. And that too, I think, is a certain characteristic of being the youngest. You spend different amounts of time with different folks and are picking up different parts of life from each of your siblings and your parents. So I think it's a bit of a mix. I'd like to talk about your parents for a few moments, if I may. How did they meet? Do you know? My dad was a senior guy with the old Simpsons department store chain, and, and as I said a few minutes ago, was uh, was posted to Vancouver. 
My mother was working in the accounting department of Simpson. And interestingly, especially for a long time ago, they were both married at the time when they met each other and ended up not being married to the people they were married to and married to each other. So in fact, my two sisters are daughters from my dad's first marriage, but it was a bit of a whirlwind romance and worked out very well for them over time. Good for them. Everything happens for a reason. I understand that your mother was also in real estate. She was. When the last of the tribe, me specifically, went off to school more regularly, she went into residential real estate in the West End of Toronto and was quite good at it and quite successful at it for many, many years before she passed away. I think she was in the business for about 25 years. Well, good for her. Did you have any family pets growing up? Of course. I got one of them actually over my shoulder. That would be our Dalmatian, which one of my brothers who was an artist, that's a pencil sketch drawing of Dallas the Dalmatian that we had when I was growing up. And there has always been a dog in my house ever since. I actually have an English pointer that is white with black spots and she's downstairs asleep on the couch at the moment. I'm in my home office right now and downstairs at my house is our nine-year-old English cream retriever. And my daughter's six or seven month old English cream retriever from the same breeder. So it's actually fascinating to watch the two of them playing with each other and trying to be a, a responsible grandparent to a grand puppy. <laughs> if you see things going a little bit crazy here, Jim, you'll know what's happening. I get it. I'm on the same program. I'd like to talk about your dad for a moment. He worked at a number of companies, did he not? He did a bunch of different things. Typically, where I think he ultimately made his career was bringing American corporations into Canada. So as I said, he started out in the Simpsons. My grandfather was with Simpsons as well. And then he went to the other side of the table, as it were, first with Claretown Sound Corporation, if, if you're old enough to remember that. Peter Monk's first business in Canada and was wildly successful in the 60s and early 70s. My dad brought Magnavox to Canada until it was bought by Philips. And then he was with Toshiba in Canada and then uh, started his own business representing basically other series of product lines in Canada. He was pretty good at that stuff, pretty good at the marketing and sales relationship sort of stuff and made a pretty decent career. Your skill set and your track record of climbing a ladder, so to speak, is not something that's started with your generation. Your parents were great examples to follow. Absolutely. My parents were great examples, and candidly, both positively and negatively so. There were, there were a few issues there as well. But I'll tell you what, one of the most interesting things that somebody said to me very early in my career, the first guy that hired me was the CEO of a fairly good-sized energy company, actually, and asked me the classic interview question, you know, what's your biggest weakness in the set? And I said, look, I've never worked in a private business. Five years in my career and I've been in politics and never in a private business. And he sent a smile and said, that's okay. You told me about your family. You grew up in this. And you know what's funny? To a certain degree, I think that's quite true. And growing up in business in very different contexts. I mean, my dad, obviously very corporate structures. And my mom's business was a very personal interaction. So again, if you kind of go back to that amalgam thing, it really has served me quite well understanding the emotions that go into the typical person buying a home, which is typically the biggest financial investment they'll make and fraught with all sorts of financial and emotional risks. It's pretty interesting especially when you contrast that with how many television sets are going to be sold next year and where are they going to be sold and how do we get them to market most effectively. It's a really interesting amalgam, candidly. That is a very cool observation. I read your father had a wonderful expression that you use frequently. It's my favorite. Learn more from scar tissue than champagne. I've never heard that. That's fabulous. It's a wonderful line. And frankly, I think it's true for everybody. And I often reflect on the biggest mistakes I've made, Jim, have always been when things are going really well. If you're in a young biotech company right after you raise money or in a fund where I've, I've been in both those contexts, just after you close a fund and you raise money because you exhale, you relax a little bit. Now, I don't want to say you lose hunger, but you lose a little bit of the hunger. And in a lot of respects, especially in entrepreneurial businesses, that hunger is critically important. I'm wondering if you have any memories of either of your parents from growing up that have stuck with you that just resonate to this day. I have all sorts of memories, positive and negative, and I can remember sitting on my dad's shoulders outside the Shadow Frontenac in Quebec City during Carnival, and 
those days, I'm not sure how you do it now. If you were staying at the Chateau, which we were, you got this little medallion that you were supposed to wear to get in the hotel. There was a throng of people. I can remember that clearly. And it's just such a wonderful example of paternal safety. A better reflection, probably my dad's attitude was teaching me to swim in the deep end of the pool. And what he would do, he'd float on his back, kind of halfway down in the pool and told me just to dive off the diving board and grab his ankles. And that's a pretty good way to learn how to literally jumping into the deep end in my mom's case, she was the Irish Catholic mother of four boys, which kind of tells you everything you need to know about her. There were two teams, hers and the other. <laughs> and there are only two places to be, on her team or the other. Kind of reflects a lot that's happened in my life where I, I tend to be a deeply loyal person, probably to a fault, frankly. And a lot of the things I've done are kind of based on that kind of team belonging and behavior that come out of that experience. But she was also totally, I tell it like it is, person. I mean, you you got the straight goods from her. And if ever you were going to be told when you were messing up, it was mom that was going to tell you. Dad would find a very diplomatic way of kind of getting it to you. But my mom would just tell you two by four across the head. Sounds like our parents were hewn from the same bolt of cloth. Where in Toronto exactly did you grow up? I grew up in the West End in the Kingsway. Honestly, it was in terms of comfort. It was absolutely a privileged upbringing. And there were problems. My dad had a reasonably serious drinking problem, Jim, which brought all sorts of ups and downs in life and pretty good lessons in that as well. But you know what? Also kind of reflects the extraordinary maternal instinct of my mother just to protect everything and maintain everything. And, and it all kind of worked out. Were there challenges in that? Of course there were. But in the relative context of the rest of the world, they weren't exactly big problems to worry about. You've said that you developed an interest in politics very early in life. How early are we talking about? Well, let's just say that I am, with a handful of other people, personally responsible for the age of membership in the Liberal Party of Canada being moved to 14 years. A long, long time ago, there's no longer such a thing as membership. It's a different kind of construct, but it was pretty early. Where did that seed get planted? I think it's kind of back to that classic kitchen table uh, sort of discussions. We were always discussing issues. We were always discussing different sides. One of the other things I, I used to say a lot, but I discovered at some point that not everybody gets the joke if you don't really understand it. I used to say that we were Irish so that no good meal was complete without a fight, but really it was more a question of debate. There was always a very healthy debate at the table. And, and one of my brothers in particular, but probably all of us at different times, would take the other side of an argument just because. <laughs> my mother was certainly a very progressive person and valued and promoted progressive ideals uh, throughout her life. So I think that is largely responsible for it as well. So you grew up in the Kingsway. What high school did you go to? I went to Richfield Collegiate. Would you have been found hanging out? Were you in the back of the school? Or were you hanging out at the cafeteria during spares playing cards? It will probably surprise you to learn that I was pretty active in the Students' Council, of which I was the problem. I had some fun with drama as well, which uh, rests positively in my memory. I'm a pretty enthusiastic follower of sports. I'm an enthusiastic golfer. I've been an enthusiastic runner, amongst other things. But I'm not a particularly good athlete, candidly, Jim. So I was more of a cheerer than a, uh, than a player, but that's okay. I'm not going to let this go. Drama, were you a lead in a play? Was it a musical? No, it was, it was only one year or two. I wish, with the benefit of a little bit of hindsight, I wished I'd done more. And for whatever reason, I didn't. I don't think I took it as seriously as, as I might have. I also read that when you were in high school, you already kind of had a plan about where your life was going to be headed. Is that correct? I thought politics for sure. And that's exactly what happened for the first five years of my career after university. In fact, frankly, throughout university. But eventually, I got a real job. So you went to McMaster and did your undergrad there and you graduated in what, 84? Being technical, I left in 84. I didn't actually graduate till 88 or 9. And this is a classic story of political staff. I left with one or three credits left to do something like that. And I'll tell you a funny story. After the uh, 1987 provincial election in which we won a very large majority, I think the largest in the history of the province at the time, if not still. I came to the office one day and the guy I was working for, who was a great guy and a, and a very good mentor of mine, told me that this fellow was, was joining the office. And I said, oh, what's he doing? And he said, well, he's going to do your job. And I said, oh, okay, what am I going to do? And he said, well, actually, you're going to go back to McMaster and, and finish those two credits that you told me you were going to finish. I had said I would do it part-time at U of T while I was working at Queen's Park, which is uh, one of those things that sounds really simple in theory and is virtually impossible in practice. And to his credit and my enormous gratitude, he forced me to go back to finish. 
So it wasn't a huge hardship, but I got those couple of forces and in fact graduated. Who knows if I would have had he not just forced me. Good for him. Who was that? That's fine. Gordon Ashworth. He's a very good friend of mine and a bit of a legend in Canadian politics. I'm eternally in his debt for having forced me to do that. So you did a bachelor's degree in political sciences and government and a minor in history. My degree's in history, and so we can bore one another on a whole bunch of different levels. <laughs> <laughs> so you're studying political science, and I read that one of your favorite courses was a history of medicine class taught by Professor Charles Rowland. Was that a basket-weaving course you were thinking, hey, I'll take that to just fill up some time, or was there kind of a, a nascent interest in life sciences starting to bud there? I think the life sciences part is coincidental. I mean, maybe it's a function of having done my degree at McMaster. The reality is that's one of the courses that I went back to do when I was trying to finish the, the degree. To be fair, there's probably a reflection of my attitude at that moment. They were entirely general courses. I needed nothing for my major requirements or any of the obligatory courses so I could do whatever I wanted. It just sounded like a cool course. He was a terrific professor. I just found it fascinating. And it was a really, really interesting course on how vaccines were discovered about Mr. Lister, who discovered Listerine. It was just a really, really interesting course. And I kind of flatter myself by saying I've been lucky to be driven by curiosity a lot of the time and just sort of taking me down different tracks because I was curious or interested in them. And, that, and that's certainly one course. But, but again, I think the coincidence of life sciences is just that. We touched earlier very briefly on your first job. You went to Ottawa before you were at Queen's Park. I worked the summer for the first Prime Minister Trudeau, and I worked for John Turner when he was running for leadership of the Liberal Party and briefly when he was Prime Minister, doing uh, all advance work. Hi, it's Jim Wilson here. NGB Ideas is part of Next Great Big Ideas, Canada's Life Sciences Summit. This is an in-person speakers event taking place at the Hamilton Convention Center on the first Monday in October. If you're a leader, an innovator, a disruptor, or you work for one, NGBI is the Canadian Life Sciences Networking event you want to attend. For details and to purchase tickets, please go to nextgreatbigideas.com. Mr. Turner was prime minister for four months from June to September of 1984 before being defeated by the conservative tide under Brian Mulroney. So you left that job and then you came back to Toronto and you were working on David Peterson's campaign in Ontario, which we touched on earlier. So you went from political defeat to a huge political victory. What was that time like? It's the essence of politics that you have to be prepared to accept both sides of the game. The first campaign I worked on was in 1979, which the Liberal Party lost, shortly followed by a big victory in 1980. There's a provincial election in there as well. I was still at school, so I went from Ottawa back to uh, finish my degree. And then um, the provincial election came around in the uh, early part of 1985. But for a couple of exams I had to write and pass, by the way, I left early to work with David's campaign in, in 1985. So you were there from 85 to 90 when the Peterson government was defeated by the NDP, led by Bob Ray at the time. I like to think about it two ways. I was there from the day that David was sworn in to the day he was sworn out. And I like his expression, which is that he left politics for health reasons, which are the people got sick of him. That too is a wonderful lesson because frankly, we should never have lost that election. We probably shouldn't have called it in the first place. It's also a source of, of another good lesson in life. And it turns out actually there's good neuroscience behind this lesson, but let's just rely on the lesson itself, which is generally speaking, when you have a fight between your head and your gut, listen to your gut. And it turns out that your body understands an awful lot more than you do. And there were a bunch of us who weren't convinced that election was really a good idea and said nothing because intellectually it was unquestionably a good idea. We had been polling above 50% for the longest time. Martin Bullfarb was our pollster at the time for the longest time and that, that Martin had been doing polling. The data were very strong. The opposition was nowhere. It was unquestionably on paper. It was a great idea. Obviously turned out to be a remarkably lousy idea. Lessons learned. That election was in October 1990, and all of a sudden you needed a job. That's true. I think what I just heard is nobody saw the writing on the wall heading into that election. It, it probably, through the election, as the numbers started to turn, it was like, oh, oh, this isn't going in the right direction. So you found yourself at the front door of Queen's Park looking in instead of on the inside looking out. What did you do? Did you, did you think about consulting or doing public relations work? 
We did two things. The first, my wife, who I'm at working with, David, we both work for David, that became an unwise situation. So she went to work for Rob Pritchard when he became president of U of T, which was in July 1990, I believe. So she'd only been there a couple of months, and she said, you know what, let's go away somewhere. And it's a funny experience, Jim, to have Peter Mansbridge at the time tell the world that you've been fired. And you know, when you work with all clicks, especially, frankly, at a bit of a senior level for a high-profile politician, you become kind of a marked person in the community, right? Everybody knows what you do and, and everybody wants to talk to you about different stuff, which is kind of fun. But at the same time, when it goes south, it's kind of unpleasant. And so Rob, to his credit, basically gave my wife more or less a month off after she worked for him for like three months. And we went to France. We had no responsibilities in life and nothing really to worry about. And we just wandered around Paris and then the rest of France for the better part of a month. And that was the great solve to an open wound. And then it came back. I spent two or three years doing different public affairs things as primarily a consultant, which is something I knew I didn't really want to do, that I wanted to go into a more live business role. I then found a role working for the CEO of a good size energy company. I mentioned him a few minutes ago. And he made me a deal, which was wonderful. He said, okay, you help us set up a public affairs program in Canada and the States and Mexico. You do that for me first and we'll find you a business check, which is exactly the way it worked out. I spent 18 months or two years doing the public affairs function. And then he came to me one morning. He was an early guy. Being the kind of ambitious person I was, I was at the office of 650, right? And so he came into my office and said, okay, we made a deal two years ago. You've done your part. Uh, now I want you to know, think about which business role you'd take in the organization. And we talked about two or three options and agreed what they were. And he said, okay, cool. You go away and think about it. Let me know by Friday what you want to do. Needless to say, the kind of person he was, he was in my office at seven o'clock Tuesday morning and said, okay, what did you decide? Which was taking over the sales organization at that time in Ontario. And then it kind of morphed into major accounts relationship across the country. Also a really interesting experience because back to jumping into the deep end, the learning balance sheet and profit and loss statements while doing is, a, is an interesting experience. Also pretty interesting being the kid in the nice suit that comes from the CEO's office to show us what we're going to do. And that required a high degree of diplomacy to work my way through that. It eventually worked out pretty well. I enjoyed it. I learned a ton over the course of, I think, four years. I probably would have made a lot more money had I just stayed still and stayed in the energy business. It just wasn't something that I wanted to do. So I sat back and said to myself, okay, you want to be in business. Where are the logical businesses that are kind of a nexus between your public affairs and public policy knowledge and the things that you find interesting and, and relevant? Certainly energy would be one of them, but I wasn't really all that moved. And I basically narrowed it down into two industries. One was uh, healthcare and the other was communications publishing. And the opportunity came along in healthcare that worked out kind of nicely. Eventually, there was some deliberate action on my part to take me into the industry. And it's, as I say, it's worked out pretty nicely. That was in the 90s. And in June 2000, you became a founding partner of NDI Capital. Here's the abbreviated version of that chunk of time. I was in a couple of healthcare services businesses as a junior partner, learned a fair bit and made a couple of dollars through that process. I had then had exited one of those businesses and I was walking down the street in Toronto when a friend of mine came out the other way, his headhunter going like this. And I said, why are you waving your finger at me? He said, you know what? I was just talking to somebody and he described what he wanted. And then you're standing in front of me and you're exactly what he wants. And so it was a, my first partner in the venture capital business, who was one of the pioneers in uh, biotech in Canada, a scientist who wanted to create a fund, but wanted to focus on the science only and not the business part and needed somebody who would manage the business part. So we created a fund that invested in biotech companies, primarily in Canada, that was a pretty exciting moment in the industry and a, and a lot of fun. And so we did that for uh, probably 15 years through two iterations. And it kind of got to a point, Jim, where we realized that unless we were able to raise serious capital, we weren't really going to be terribly relevant. We were a bit of an unorthodox fund, and it was really kind of hard to demonstrate the value of raising a ton of money. And one of the things that had also happened along the way is that we discovered we were actually a little bit better at running companies, effectively acquiring companies and, and running them to an exit than pure VC investing. 
So one of those companies was a neuroscience company that we liked the technology a lot. We thought there was real potential in, it, in the neuroscience space. It was in the Alzheimer's space specifically. And so I took over that company as CEO and ran it for 10 years almost, literally from late preclinical development through a global phase three study in a neurodegenerative indication that is analogous in some ways to Alzheimer's disease, certainly meant to be a proxy for the potential of that product in Alzheimer's disease. It was called Alon Therapeutics. I learned a ton of lessons there. Some of them quite positive, some of them generating some scar tissue that absolutely come to play with what we're doing today at Admari because we basically ran the studies that afford to run rather than the studies that we should have run. We should have done a lot more work in the early days that might well have better defined the potential of that product. As may be self-evident because nobody knows about the product, the phase three study failed, notwithstanding pretty interesting phase two data that clearly suggests the product had potential. We took it into a phase three study, which was the one that we could afford to run. Terrific experience. I'm very proud of the work that the team did there because we basically did two things that I think are fundamental for uh, biotech businesses. The first is there are so many things that you can't control that you better do a good job of controlling the things you can. And our team did a really good job of controlling and managing the elements of the business that you can in order to see where the data take you. The data will take you into whatever direction that it does. And, and again, it's a truism in this business. You got to follow the data, but you better control the things you can. The team did a great job of that. The other thing that the team did a really good job of was doing what we said we were going to do. Unquestionably, the reason that we were able to raise the better part of a couple hundred million dollars over that period of time to drive that company forward is we established a reputation with investors that if we said we were going to do X, Y, and Z, we get it. One of my favorite stories was we were in the midst of the volcanic eruption in Iceland, the kind of shut down air travel. And I was supposed to be speaking at a conference in London. I went to the airport, long story, mercifully abbreviated. It was problems with the flight. And eventually I paid a stupid amount of money to get on another flight in order to get to my speaking slot at this conference. Landed, went to the conference, did my spiel, and then went to the series of one-on-one -on -one meetings. And the first meeting was with a guy that I had met five times over the course of four or five years. I started the meeting by saying, okay, here's what we said we were going to do the last time we met. Here's what we've done. And here's what we're going to do over the next period of time. And it just was an effective kind of pattern. And I was walking down the hall to this one-on-one -on -one meeting gym. I was tired. I was cranky. I didn't really want to be there. I was just kind of in a miserable mood. And I walked into the room and the, and the investor was sitting there waiting for me. And I said... Ah, uh, good to see you. I don't really know what to tell you. Every time we've met, we've done exactly what we were said we we're going to do. Happy to tell you what we're going to do over the next two years or something like that. And he said, I know. I want to invest. How do we do that? He and his fund wrote a check for $10 million. Do what you say you're going to do, especially in early stage riskier investing. It pays off because people like some predictability. The data will do what the data are going to do, but at least some predictability on the management part. Polite persistence. So you left Allen Therapeutics in 2013 to become president and CEO of Viable Health Works. Why did you leave? The phase three study had failed and we sold the alpha. And so we created a new business in healthcare services by putting together a series of healthcare service clinics, which continues along today and is a viable, strong business today, has grown quite nicely. I think the team did a pretty good job of cleaning up what was a bit of a messy operation and needed some additional capital. And then I ended up in this job more or less by accident. And that is that I was on the board of a CDRD, the Center for Drug Research and Development. And we had a change of CEO kind of unexpectedly. And the board asked me to step in on an interim basis. They said three months. I thought six months which given the nature of my business was still venture capital investing, I felt that I could do that. It didn't really matter where I sat every day. And I started what I thought we could do if we organized the people properly and we organized the capital properly. Kind of funny, the board asked me to stay on and I said, yeah, you know, you're better to do a proper search. I don't really want to be the rebound date as it were. You go and do a proper search and let's see where we find ourselves. And at the end of that process, they came back to me and said, if you're interested in staying, we'd like for you to do that. Candidate Gym, this is not something I ever thought I would do, but I'm having a lot of fun because it is very meaningful. This team is making a substantive change in partnership with people all across the country and trying to help build a sustainable life sciences industry, which is absolutely necessary and possible. It's very exciting, very fun. 
I'd like to go back to the CDRD. That was a not-for-profit center for drug development and commercialization, and it was on the campus of UBC. How did you end up getting on the board originally? I had been very active in the different advocacy organizations. I think when I joined the board, I was the chair of Life Sciences British Columbia. My calculus was that as an ecosystem in British Columbia, we had made a significant political investment by encouraging the provincial government and federal government to support this organization, that I had a responsibility to try and help make it a success. So it, it was kind of a logical thing, given what I've been doing. If you've taken the uh, Institute for Corporate Director course at U of T, one of the things that they hammer into you with is the knowledge imbalance between management and the board. And it is never more clear that when you go from the board into management and you see what's really going on. And I'm not suggesting anything nefarious or bad. You go from different shades of one color to a kaleidoscope of every color imaginable and you really have to understand. And you do spend some time really kind of understanding that transition. The wonderfully interesting process to go through, as I said, anybody who's on the board of anything should try and do it once in their life. I'm Jim Wilson, and you're listening to NGB Ideas. We'll be right back. We'd like to take a moment to thank the TMX Group and the Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation for their support. We'd also like to thank our major sponsors that include Admari Bio Innovations, Omnia Bio, Bay Area Health Trust, Eurofins CDMO Alfora, Facet, Nova Nordisk, Synapse Life Sciences Consortium, Walter Fady, X Design, and lab occupier. Prior to becoming CEO of the organization, you were part of the board, so you had a sense of what was going on. Then there was a marriage of partners, if you will, in the not too distant future after you joined. I guess it was May 31st, 2019. Two of Canada's leading life sciences innovation incubators, CDRD in Vancouver and Neomed in Montreal, agreed to create this new organization called Edmari Bio Innovations. And before we talk about the organization, let's, let's talk about the name. Who came up with it and what's it mean? It's a fun process to go through coming up with a new name for a pan-Canadian enterprise. You have to think about things, obviously, that work in English and French and that try and connote what you're doing and haven't been used by somebody else. I assure you, we went through hundreds of different ideas. We had pages and pages of good ideas, dumb ideas, names we fell in love with that somebody else was using or didn't translate well. We came up with the idea of Admari because the Latin motto for Canada is Mari from C to C. And what we were building was a pan-Canadian enterprise of scale. So it made a lot of sense to us. And it turns out there was only one other organization using the name, and it's a seafood restaurant in Ottawa. <laughs> and I'm reasonably confident that nobody would confuse what we're doing with a seafood restaurant in Ottawa. The logic of putting together CDRD and subsequently Accelerex was very deliberate and very sound strategically. And it was something that those organizations kind of did together. And I give them enormous credit. Don Olds in particular, who was the CEO at the time of Neomed, was very thoughtful about what was really necessary. The challenge at the time, and it still happens to a certain degree, is that we can be very parochial in our commercialization. And every public policymaker had said, we want research organizations of whatever type to be commercializing their research. That kind of sounds kind of straightforward. And then, so what you do is you have a whole bunch of regional organizations. And at the time, the government of Canada alone had spent $400 million through 14 different organizations. And there's a certain amount of conceit involved in that, because if you believe, as I do, that most of these organizations are a function of the people that work in them, that it's about the people that you can attract, to think that you were going to have 14 organizations with 14 CEOs and CFOs and HR people and BD people and so on, and that they were actually going to have an impact in an industry like life sciences, which is a global one, particularly in an industry in Canada that is 3% of the global market. So what you're worried about is being globally relevant if you want your organization to succeed. It just doesn't make any sense to try and do it on a local basis. We set out deliberately to say, how do we build a pan-Canadian enterprise that can really get to a point of scale that has the capacity to attract the kind of scientific expertise and business expertise that's necessary? That was a very deliberate thing. And frankly, I'm pretty proud of what the team has done. I think the data validate that it was a good idea that has worked quite well. 
you're leading this organization in Vancouver and Neomed in Laval and the suburbs of Montreal. Who recognized the opportunity? Who made the call? How did you get together? At CDRD, we had made a list of all of the organizations that made logical sense and candidly those that we didn't think were logical sense and just started talking with folks. And Donald and I were at a bio convention and the two of us were having a, a cup of coffee and we were saying the same sorts of things. I finally said, well, like, maybe we should try and do this in a more serious construct. Maybe we should try and do it together. And Don said, that's a great idea. And the other thing I'll, I'll say to give credit to others in particular, about a year or so before that, I don't remember exactly. I had breakfast with Didier Jacon, who at the time was at the fall in Montreal responsible for life sciences. We were at the JP Morgan meeting in San Francisco, and we talked about the problem that I just described, the need for scale. And we have all these different organizations. And the problem with any organization, Jim, is once it's created, self-preservation becomes an, an organic necessity, right? You got to figure out how you have to survive. And so DDA and I had talked about it. And subsequently, when we hashed out the idea a little bit, DDA agreed to join our board. And he was eventually the chair of our board in a lot of ways responsible for having guided us through the public policy issues across the country that would have been a roadblock had we not thought things through carefully. The mission of Edmari, I guess you focus on four things. You build companies, you build ecosystems, you build talent, but you also focus on building awareness. When I read that, I thought that makes a whole lot of sense. I was pleasantly surprised at the emphasis on building awareness, especially within the life sciences community, which to some might need all the help it can get at the moment because of the situation that it's in. I'd like to dig it a bit further on, on the talent piece because Admari offers a leadership program that some of our guests on this podcast have taken and they speak very highly of. And I wonder if you think leadership's a skill that can be learned or do you think it's something that someone has to have in them first to be able to cultivate? I think everybody can be a leader at whatever role they're in, but there is an opportunity to provide leadership and there are all sorts of different kinds of leadership. I think absolutely it can be taught and I think everybody has the capacity to be a leader. Here's one of those experiences of having collected my share of scar tissue over time. I can remember so clearly when I was looking for work after a friend of mine, it was a guy I talked to every five or six months who was the head of HR for, for Xerox. He said, you've got to worry about culture. And I can remember thinking as a, as a young guy who was much smarter than I am now, ah, culture, whatever. And he told me, you got to worry about the vision of our, ah, ah, I just want to get on and do stuff. I'm sorry it took me so long to find the wisdom of that. And our vision is very simple. Canadian life science is leading the world. We have this extraordinary research enterprise in this country, Jim, that punches well above its weight on any metric you want to apply to it. And yet we still don't have the uh, sustainable industry. We're a heck of a lot farther today than we were four or five years ago, but we still don't love a sustainable industry. And so how do we find a way to marry the extraordinary research capacity in universities and research institutes and hospitals across the country with the potential to actually see those things reaching patients based on Canadian companies and Canadian execution, et cetera. How do you actually translate that into emissions? You say, we basically think we do three things and awareness, I think, is embedded in all of them. So we build companies. So that's about how do we actually create enterprises in Canada that can grow and scale and then you say, okay, you want to create those companies. Well, you need somewhere for them to grow because as you know, way better than I ever will know, when you're a young emerging company and you can't make a long-term promise to a landlord, a commitment to a landlord, it's really hard to find the kind of commercial lab space you need. So we say, okay, we have these two facilities today, one in Vancouver and one in Montreal as a place for young companies to emerge and grow and learn from each other and learn from our larger organizations. And then you say, okay, you've created this company and you have somewhere for them to be. You need to have the people and where those talent problems are most acute are at that senior leadership level and also at the frontline levels. Because we produce an awful lot of master's and PhD students. There's an incredible opportunity to take that expertise and apply it in a commercial context. So that's kind of where our talent business is built. Who are your partners for the organization? Everything we do is done in partnership with somebody else. If you go through each of those three pillars in building companies, we are partnering with researchers, we're partnering with research institutes, universities, hospitals, we're partnering with venture capital to help actually build that enterprise. When you look at the ecosystem part of our business, we're partnering with those groups, but also other service providers who support those organizations, whether it's business expertise or analytical expertise or uh, animal facility work. And then on the talent front, 
Again, we're partnering with all those people, but also specifically universities and content providers who really provide the material that we present to our students. And where does your funding come from? Our largest funder today is the Government of Canada. They have been a very significant supporter. I am thrilled to say that for every dollar the Government of Canada has put into this organization, we've generated a dollar of cash returns that we reinvest into the ecosystem. So I think it's turned out to be a really valuable investment on their part. We also have meaningful support from the government of Quebec, particularly around facilities in Ville saint hélène in Montreal, and the government of British Columbia in this new facility. They have historically supported CDRD quite nicely, and on the new facility that we will open and launch that's a future. If any of our listeners who are working in family institutes or have some extra cash that they would like to invest into the life sciences sector, should they be in touch with Admari about potential partnering? And there's all sorts of places where it makes sense for us to partner with people on that front. Certainly from an investment perspective, obviously, we often working with venture capital partners to find the capital necessary for the companies that we help create. Certainly, some of our programs have benefited significantly from external sponsorship funding. Uh, Pfizer Canada deserves a lot of credit for the Executive Institute. They funded the whole thing from start to finish. So we'd be delighted to hear from anybody that wants to work with us. Funding is, of course, you know, one of the stumbling blocks to continuing to build the Canadian life sciences sector. And there are, are occasional and very welcome announcements. One of those announcements was March 30th, 2022, and Admari Bioinnovations received $92 million from the federal government. What was that money earmarked for? So that was meant to do really a handful of things, certainly our core funding in our own facilities, because when we partner with someone, we generally speaking, bring that research into our own labs in Vancouver or in Montreal. So funding that process, some of it was meant to do invest in those kinds of companies. Some of it was meant to support the talent development part of our business as well. What I'm about to say may sound nonsensical to some of our listeners, but this funding announcement obviously was very welcome, but it's not an overwhelming amount of money. For example, some of the equipment needed in research labs can be pushing in and is often north of a million dollars just for one piece of equipment. And on top of that, building lab space is very expensive, which is the primary reason that we have so little of it to lease to scaling biotech companies. So $92 million will help us get closer to the goal line, but it's not going to push the puck into the net. We need more shared lab space in this country, and you perhaps more so than anyone else are in a position to see the building wave of demand for that lab space. And I would appreciate your thoughts on where we are at the moment and what needs to get done so we can get to the next level. Let's first put the amount of money in, in context. When we went through the process that I described a few years ago before we graded at Mara, we looked at the relative investments of different public agencies across North America. The Government of Canada, to their credit, spent $400 million in the previous 10 years through 14 different organizations. The government of the state of Massachusetts, the leading biotech cluster in the world, spent a billion and a half to maintain its leadership. The state of California, the home to the second largest biotech cluster spent a billion to maintain their leadership position. So it is absolutely an expensive uh, under. I think it's important to recognize that governments across the country have made a significant investment in this industry. Spurred on to a meaningful degree by the pandemic that we all lived through, the government of Canada has committed 2.1 or 2.2 billion dollars. The government of Quebec's significant investments, the government of Ontario's significant investments, government of British Columbia's significant investments, and other provincial governments as well. They're kind of doing the right thing. To your specific question, what gives me pause is commercial wet lab space meant for organizations that are fully VC funded, sure call it 50, $75 million in BC funding through to those that are fully self-sustainable. The market will ultimately figure that out. And there, there will be pressure points and there will be problematic spaces that, again, you know better than anybody else, but the market will figure that out. What I worry a lot of are those companies that we're actively engaged in creating and are the source of those next long-term tenants for commercial landlords that can't make that long-term commitment. You can do targeted things. So take the example of what the government of British Columbia has done. They made a commitment to us to open a new facility, 35,000 square feet plus or minus, focused on emerging companies to provide them that, that space that they need to grow until they can afford to move out into another space. And one hopes the market to catch up to some of the commercial building, but to give those companies the opportunity to grow the way they need. We've seen that in uh, Quebec as well. That's exactly what our facility 
in Ville Saint Laurent and Montreal does. It's 150,000 square feet. It's home to 30 some odd companies ranging from four and five employees up to about 150. And there is really something incredible about the situational alchemy that happens when you have small organizations and large organizations together and they learn from each other. And they really do. The big folks learn just as much from the small folks as the other way around. That's the stuff that I really worry about and I think is absolutely necessary if we're going to carry on the charge. I think we need that space all over the country. Certainly, I think we're making progress in British Columbia. We could absolutely fill another 100,000 square feet in Montreal if we were able to do it. And I think that need exists in Toronto as well. Mars is what Mars is. It's, it's a terrific entity and, and we're partnered with Mars, but you need to do more than just provide the space. There's a whole issue of the animation, of the lunch and learn, and providing the opportunities for people to learn from each other, creating all of those kind of environmental issues that I think is really important. And if that can be done in partnership with Mars, cool. If it needs to be done by creating a different all facility, not on that scale, the scale of Mars is extraordinary, but just in a very focused way, I think that's really, really important to do. Hi, it's Jim Wilson with a reminder that the NGB Ideas podcast and the next Great Big Ideas Summit have been created to raise awareness and financial support for McMaster Children's Hospital. If you are able and interested in providing financial support for a worthy cause, we hope you will consider MCH. To learn more about the team at McMaster Children's Hospital and the life-saving work they do, please go to hamiltonhealthsciences.ca slash McMaster hyphen children's hyphen hospital. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to today's show. We're talking about challenges uh, within the sector, and I'd like to pivot for a moment and ask what you think is the most challenging part of your job. It's always about people. In my view, things only happen because we get the right collection of people with the right approach, and they share a perspective, and they share a vision but they also share a set of values about how they work as an organization. Assembling that team, working with that team, and helping them lead the ecosystem in partnership with others is a huge challenge and a source of great encouragement and satisfaction. Let me turn that question around. What's the best part of your job? There's probably a couple of parts that are examples of the same thing. Seeing a company in which we've had a small part succeed and really advance is very rewarding. Seeing people in whom we've invested through our leadership development program or our bioinnovation science program, seeing them flourish and seeing their careers advance is wonderfully rewarding. At any given time, we have eight to 10 co-op students, undergrads from across the country. And one of the things that we do with those co-ops is at the end of their term, they have to do a presentation to the whole company on what they're working on, explain the data and defend the data. And it is a wonderful, wonderful experience to see them having joined the organization. And just eight months later, all of a sudden they're standing up in front of all of the organization and defending the data. It's hugely rewarding. And the funny little secret that I always tell them at the end of that process, we always learn more from them than they learn from us. And there's a logic to that too, Jim, because if you think about we're heavily populated with PhDs who learned their science a long time ago, generally speaking. It's a lot of work to stay on top of things, especially in a, in a business that's growing. So it's really interesting to see young people come who are looking at it all through different eyes, maybe a naive perspective. And I say that respectfully, it's just very, very helpful. And there's a great example from Mac, actually. I think we had four or five bioinformatics students from Mac in the same core. It's just kind of the way it worked out. We don't usually do that. It just, it happened to be the case. It was hugely valuable to us at, in the kind of early days of real AI ML impacts on more early stage research. It was great. So you've worn more than a few hats in your career. Has your definition of success changed over time? How do you measure success today? One of the conversations we have with our children is to be careful about the measures of success that you use because the typical metrics are usually pretty lousy ones and there's always going to be somebody doing better than you. So my measure is to say, what did I set out to do? And am I continuing to advance towards that? And with a deep belief that at the risk of sounding like the Hallmark breeding card salesman, life is a journey. Are you advancing in the journey? Because you never actually get there. I guess we all get to the same place eventually. <laughs> Have you made progress towards that? Have you helped other people along the way? Have you enjoyed it? And have you learned? 
you run a large corporation with a lot of people who answer to you. And like any CEO, you need to delegate and compromise to get things done. But what that means oftentimes is that you don't always get what you want. How difficult is that road to navigate? We have a really good team of people that I have come to rely on quite meaningfully and frankly are responsible for the lion's share of anything successful. You need to decide which things are important, which things are mission critical, if you will, and which things are kind of nice to have. And as long as you are not compromising on those essential things that are fundamental to achieve the vision or the mission of the organization, things are good. I can compromise on, on all of the other stuff. Are there any specific situations or moments you've experienced that have changed the way you work or live? I'll tell you one story that is very meaningful to me. Every time that I tell it in public, I usually have a hard time getting through it. But I'll tell you about my brother, John, who was a wonderful, wonderful person. He was an artist by vocation, worked in, in different creative industries throughout his life. And he was HIV positive for almost 30 years. And he just approached that with a level of diligence and discipline that is awe-inspiring. He just decided that wasn't going to define who he was. And he um, basically went on a whole range of different treatments over time. And I'll tell you, the, the funny thing is my family deals with stressful situations with humor. There are a bunch of examples of the. But I can remember the day he called me to say he was starting a new drug regimen tomorrow, and it was created by a Canadian biotech company. I can remember thinking, what an extraordinary opportunity that would be to work in that industry. It's stretching the point to say that there's a cause and effect there. So the humor piece is, I can remember when he called me that day, he also said, it's actually kind of funny. When I look at the things I have to be prepared to accept, at some point down the road in the future, I might get cancer. So I can either die now or die later. I and of course, eventually the bill became due and 30 years later, cancer arrived. It was six years ago now. In the early days of medical assistance, he was in palliative care and I genuinely thought that he would make that choice. I asked him about it and he said, I've bought every day. And I think what a just a wonderful approach to life. He just decided to fight for every single bill and literally he did. Thank you for sharing that. That's a lovely story in spite of the, the topic. Thank you. We talked earlier about the ad advice your father gave you. Are there pieces of advice others have given you that have helped set your professional compass? I have been really, really fortunate to have a number of really good mentors and colleagues along the way. John Turner was very good to me and a bunch of people in business, my original partners in our life science fund, my colleague, Matthew Carlisle, who uh, we've been partners together for coming on 25 years now in, in different businesses, a source of a whole bunch of good advice and camaraderie. Incredibly important to have those kinds of people around you, people that you can trust and rely on to tell you the straight goods. And that's one of the biggest challenges when you end up running any organization is that people try and be nice to you. They try and make everything sound all right. Probably one of the biggest challenges of leadership anywhere, and whatever kind of leadership you pursue, is to understand what's all right and what's not all right. Really try and find out what's really going on. And the way I do that, and again, this is the source of uh, lessons that have been taught to me, just keep asking questions. And they're quite often innocent. One of the things that David Peterson used to say, when people were briefing him on different things, he'd get the main point, he'd say, what else? And they'd say something else. And they'd say, what else? They'd say something else. And he'd get to about three or four what else's. And after about six months of watching this, I said, so what's with the what else? And he kind of laughed. He said, Gordy, by the third what else, they don't know what else to say. So they start telling you what's really going on. People come with their speaking points. And then you get those and say, well, what else? And then, well, you can give you a variation on that. And what else? And you eventually get to the truth. I read a book once. I, I wish I could remember which one, but it, it was written by a uh, prosecutor who used to say that the most amazing thing is that people will always lead you to the dead body in the closet. They will find a way of unintentionally telling you about it, either by what they choose to say or they choose not to say. And in some respects, the what else is kind of like that. This is NGB Ideas. I'm Jim Wilson. If you're enjoying today's show, you might also enjoy listening to our interview with John Lewis, who is founder and CEO of Entos Pharmaceuticals in Edmonton. You can find that interview by dipping into our archive at ngbideas.podbean.com or wherever you download your podcasts. 
Let's get back to today's show. I'd like to touch on someone who I think was very important in your life and who was the person who introduced us, John Duffy. John, unfortunately, passed away suddenly in March 22, and his passing was obviously a huge loss to his family and to his many friends and to Canada. And I know you and John were very close, and if it's not too much to ask, I'd appreciate you taking a few months to tell us about him. John was an incredible character, man. An encyclopedic knowledge of Canadian history and world history down to a, a level of granularity that was quite extraordinary and was a lot of fun. And one of the great pleasures is that John and I were very close in politics in our early parts of our career. And then and then life goes on. And I when I moved to Vancouver, two of our kids, our, our sons, our oldest and youngest, were very active in debate, which is a whole other question of the wisdom of teaching a teenager to argue. They were both pretty good at it. Our youngest son was practicing for a, a world debate competition with a small team of Canadian debaters. And he came downstairs one day and said, you know, dad, do you know this guy named John Duffy? Said, of course, I know John Duffy. Well, of course, it was John's daughter who was uh, one of the other debaters. And so it was actually kind of very cool for us as parents to effectively be in, been brought back together again as we were by our children. John was a wonderful guy, a source of great energy and ideas and information and passion about everything he did. And while it is absolutely a tragedy that his life ended up being much shorter than it should have been, we should all live our lives with the passion that John lived every single day. Totally an inspiration. Let's wander back to business. Where do you see the Canadian life sciences sector today? And what are some of the holes in the system that you would like to see fixed? I spend an awful lot of energy thinking about this, and I think it is important to step back and look at the academic literature and what it tells us about ecosystems. An ecosystem is, generally speaking, synthetically built with public policy dollars and investment in research institutes, in hospitals, in universities, in organizations like ours and, and other parts, in advocacy organizations that participate in the construct of an ecosystem. But what you want to have ultimately is a cluster. This was classically defined by Michael Porter about 25 years ago. And basically what he demonstrated is that when you have a cluster around a domestic anchor company, all parts of that ecosystem thrive around that, whether they're smaller organizations, entrepreneurial organizations, spinoff organizations, different investors, service providers, and so on. So in my way of approaching this, We've got a very strong ecosystem in this country. We need to ultimately build it into one or a series of strong life sciences clusters. I think it's also important that you have to support all parts of an ecosystem to become a cluster. So people, I'm pretty sure, are tired of hearing me talk about the importance of domestic anchor companies. When you look at the Canadian life sciences ecosystem, it punches well above its weight on any metric you want. We have outstanding research. We have decent venture capital. We have strong components throughout the ecosystem. The one thing we do not hold is the only advanced pharma market in the world without a research-based domestic anchor company. Now, I think that's an aspirational problem. And that's one of the things that drives a lot of us at, at Mari. How do we help build those anchor companies? If we get to the point where we're building those anchor companies, this industry becomes self-sustaining and it becomes a real powerhouse. So you have the basic research enterprise quite strong. You have the industrial output of that quite strong as well. And it's important to say, Jim, none of that denigrates the other parts of the ecosystem. Multinational pharma companies are incredibly important to the ecosystem. All parts are important, but the one piece we're missing today is that a series of domestic anchor companies. It's also important to note that if you asked this question six, seven years ago, we didn't really have much prospect of, a, of an anchor company. But when you look around today and you see Abcelera and Stem Cell and Xenon and Bellis was just sold, they see uh, Abdera, there's a long list of 10 or 15 potential anchor companies. So we're making significant progress towards that. And we're meaningfully better today than we were even five years ago. And we just need to get to a point where there are multiple domestic anchor companies in Canada. That will make a profound change in the sustainability of this life sciences ecosystem. Thank you for that. I agree exactly with what you are saying. Some of our listeners may be wondering what you mean by an anchor. 
This isn't me. This is Michael Porter. In his work, he will tell you that an anchor company is a large commercial enterprise. It typically dominates a geographic area. It has uh, typically something like 500 or more employees. It has something like a billion and a half dollars in value, probably has hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in commercial sales. It makes investments. It is the source of reinvestment into the community. It is the source of spin out talent into the community. It attracts talent and then it spins out talent. It's a very valuable thing. The classic example, probably in Canadian terms, might be uh, BlackBerry. People think about the impact that BlackBerry had in Waterloo and that whole triangle is incredibly important. Unfortunately, not as strong today as, as it was, but the impact is quite compelling. We need to create a series of those across the country. And again, I'm really encouraged by where we are. We still got to get there to, to have a, a number of them. Thank you. You mentioned something earlier about talent, and I'd, I'd like to go back to that. Rob Henderson is president and CEO of Biotalent Canada has suggested the Canadian life sciences sector will have a talent deficit of 65,000 jobs by 2029. How concerned should we be and what do we need to do to change that trajectory? There's a lot of things I think happening today that make a big difference there at all levels of employee and all levels of, of education. So for example, with CASEL, the Canadian Alliance of Skills Training and Health Sciences, which is focused on helping build the biomanufacturing talent necessary whether it is new skills, reskilled, or upskilling, the kind of programs that we do with bioinnovation scientists program to help those recently graduated masters and PhD students understand how to apply their expertise in a commercial context, the kind of leadership program that we have to help build the leadership cadre, the work that different business schools and science schools across the country do in developing talent is incredibly important, and immigration is incredibly important because we need to attract specialized skills as well. So there's, I think there's a lot going on and a lot more to do, absolutely. The question that we end all of our interviews on is the one that I'll ask you next. I'm wondering what the next great big idea is on your horizon. I think the honest answer is we have no damn idea. One of the dirty little secrets is the serendipity. Who would have predicted four or five years ago the impact of Zempic and other weight loss drugs. It's clearly a big problem, but all of a sudden it has become a dominant category that nobody seriously would have predicted as recently as, as five years ago. To me, the source of that next big idea, if people smarter than me are, are going to figure that out, what I want to do is help create an environment in which that idea can come forward and in which that idea is challenged and interrogated early so that it becomes stronger and better. Again, what your dear old mom probably told you, right? If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. It's absolutely true in science and drug development. So let's create an environment and a culture where those ideas have the opportunity to come forward and have the opportunity to be challenged and interrogated and stressed to see whether or not they have the potential to succeed. And then what you want to do if you want to succeed in this business is you follow the data. Be absolutely committed to following the data to wherever they take you. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you spending your afternoon with us. And this has been lovely. Thanks. Well, thank you. I, re I really enjoy the opportunity, enjoy the conversation. And thank you for doing this, Jim. I think it's really important to build dialogue and build conversations that are important across the country of different players. I love the idea of the next big idea event. I'm looking forward to joining you there. And I just really appreciate the leadership that you and your colleagues are providing in the ecosystem. It's incredibly important to all of us. Well, it's very kind. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the show this week. That was Gordon McCauley, President and CEO of Admari Bioinnovations. If you'd like to follow Gord on social, you can find him at G.C. McCauley. That's G-C-M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y. And you can follow his team at Admari, that's A-D-M-A-R-E, underscore bio. I'm Jim Wilson, and you've been listening to NGB Ideas from Lab Occupier. Thanks to Tisha Prasad for researching and editing today's show. We are on social at NGB Ideas, and you can follow me at Lab Occupier. If you'd like to email me, my address is jwilson at Leonard, that's L-E-N-N-A-R-D, dot com. Thanks again for listening. 
See you next week.